Okay, so uh, today I'd like to show some uh, recent simulations I've been doing of the uh, thermal and plasma environment uh, within lunar pits and prospective lava tubes. And uh, I've really been thinking about how cold do these regions really get under the surface uh, if we have shadowed regions and lava pits, and could they collect uh, ions from the solar wind uh, as the moon rotates uh, through a lunar day. And here I'm showing um, the uh, Mare Tranquilitatis pit up on the top left and a simulated version of that pit uh, using a new uh, heating code that I've developed and um, showing uh, roughly the same kind of illumination and also the simulated temperature uh, at a certain time of day. And I'll talk more about these uh, pictures in, a, in a, the next few slides. Um, okay. Right, so it's well known uh, by now that uh, lunar pits could provide partial shelter from the space element uh, during in situ exploration. Uh, for instance, uh, micrometeoroids, uh, harmful radiation, plasma, uh, thermal, uh, uh, you know, temperature variations, and we're developing a suite of codes uh, at APL to characterize at least the thermal and plasma parts of the picture. Uh, and so some of the questions I have are basically how does the solar wind flow into these lunar pits uh, as the moon rotates through a day? Uh, and are the, do the shadowed regions really ever become, if there are shadowed regions in these you know, extensive, maybe extensive networks of caves or, or permanently shadowed regions, are they cold enough to collect and store those volatiles delivered daily by the solar wind? Uh, okay, right, so uh, we know now that uh, lunar pits uh, are found all across the globe uh, of the moon, uh, across a wide range of latitudes. Uh, they span a range of sizes, depths, and shapes. Um, and right, so they could experience very different uh, heating and plasma environments uh, based on all these different parameters. And this is these are the um, things that we'd like to investigate. Uh, and of course, uh, we know that the uh, subsurface pit structure is virtually unknown uh, because we can only see into the pits from orbit. Uh, all, we can only see a certain amount into the pits. Um, so can we simulate this? And what, what could these simulations tell us about the daily environment? Uh, OK, so here's a picture from a code that I've recently developed at APL. It's a, a 3D voxel-based heat equation solver. Uh, and it basically simulates uh, a homogeneous bulk lunar-like solid. Um, I've used uh, lunar thermal parameters, and uh, my equations apparently aren't showing up at the bottom, but that's fine. Uh, uh, so, right, uh, so this code, you could basically set up any arbitrary void that you want. So I can build a lunar pit to match some of the, the uh, properties of pits that we see on the moon. And it has time-dependent solar illumination, so the sun will go overhead over uh, many days and uh, heat the surface, and we can fully model the uh, heating of the surface by the sun and how that heat conducts deep into the into the ground and if there are lunar pits under there, I'm sorry, uh, lunar lava tubes under there, um, we can model the flow of heat into these regions. And well, I'll get to this in a minute. One thing we're not including, we are including the direct illumination by the sun, but hot areas within a pit could re-radiate some of that energy into cold regions. That's going to be very important for understanding the thermal environment in shadowed regions. Uh, we're not including that in the code right now. It just uh, simply hasn't been implemented yet. Uh, but that's the next thing we want to do. So I have a video here that they said I could request that it be played. OK, and what this will show is, um, if it comes up, OK, there it is. This is a 2D slice of a simulation, just to kind of give you a flavor of what we're working on. Uh, it's a really small domain. It's only maybe four or five, four by five meters, so it's, it's not really um, large like the lunar pits that we know of. But it gives you uh, an idea. You can see the sun is going overhead. This is temperature that you're seeing in the colors in, in the, being plotted here. The sun is going overhead and going overhead uh, over many days, heating up the surface. The surface will heat to maybe 400 Kelvin uh, or more. This is at zero degrees latitude. And then at night, when the sun goes down, the, the surface cools. And of course, all this heat is uh, conducting into the surface at a very slow, into the bulk solid at a very slow rate. Um, and so then we run the simulation. Basically, I've, I've now made it 3D using a larger domain. We can run the simulation for thousands of lunations to get a, a quasi-steady quasi equilibrium. OK. Uh, this is a long, OK, there we go. 
Right, and I just pulled out a uh, surface temperature profile right at the surface. Looks a lot like what we expect from theory. Uh, this uh, nice 1963 Soviet paper and more recent work uh, by, for instance, uh, Vasavada 99. Uh, and and uh, the subsurface temperature sort of follows along like we think, but at a lower level, um, this is only a few centimeters into the ground. Um, so at least in that respect, it agrees with theory. Um, Right, so here's the actual model of a lunar pit that we used. Uh, this is straight uh, straight out of the code. Um, basically, it's, I don't know why it's changing on me, but it's um, meant to, mo it's, it's sort of a mock-up of the Mare Tranquilitatis pit. Uh, it, in this case, it's much smaller, uh, just because of computational feasibility issues. Uh, we're scaling the code up to be able to do larger domains. Uh, but you can see, um, it has uh, basically an opening uh, to space with a, a bit of a slope. Um, and then it's uh, not just a cylinder, but sort of a uh, has recessed walls as they go down. And just uh, we put in some uh, lava tubes as well uh, just to see what would happen. And I point out uh, the little white circle on the middle plot is the uh, how big this pit is with respect to Mare Twin Tranquilitatis. Uh, but it's, it's a nice test case. So. What I've done is pulled out snapshots of the illumination and temperature profile within this pit uh, as a function of time. And we're sort of looking down from above into the pit, right? And so at 6 a.m. lunar time, uh, the sun is just coming up over the horizon. So we don't have any illumination, um, which you can see on the left there. At 8 o'clock, the sun just begins to peek over the rim of the pit. And as the sun continues to move overhead, that shaft of light moves across the floor of the pit up the other wall, and then the sun goes down at 1800. Um, so I've also plotted surface temperatures at each of these times. Uh, at 6 a.m., it's a little hard to see the color scheme, but the uh, surface is still warm from the previous day's heating. Uh, so it's a little bit red, and then as the sun comes up, you start to get hotter and hotter, and the uh, interior of the pit then also becomes, uh, is heated uh, directly by the sun. Um, the sun goes down, and now we end up hotter than we did in the morning, of course, because we've been, we've been heated all day long. And then that uh, region will cool overnight and, and we'll start over. One thing to notice is it's a little hard to see, but the region of peak heating on the floor of the pit uh, actually trails the, it trails the uh, illumination of that shaft of light because it takes a little while for the surface to heat up. So you'll see the hottest areas sort of at the tail end of the illuminated region. Um, and one other thing to note is I, this uh, simulation, the lowest temperatures are probably a little bit too low because um, it hasn't been run. It's only been run out for about 600 uh, lunar days. Uh, we probably need more like 6,000 or even more uh, to truly let uh, thermal conduction within the surface reach a quasi-steady equilibrium. But it, it gives us a qualitative picture of, uh, begins to give us a qualitative picture of what's, what's going on here. Okay, so it's really hard to see this, but now we're down inside the lava tube looking out at the illuminated wall at about 2.30 p.m. And uh, you can see uh, the surface, this is the temperature over here. Uh, the floor of the, the pit is, of course, really hot. And the wall is, is uh, warm as well. Uh, so if we're back inside the lava tube, since we can see these hot regions, we'll be collecting heat from them. And the walls of the tube will be heating up as well. Unfortunately, uh, this hasn't been implemented into the code yet, but it's the very next step that we want to take. Uh, okay, and then I'll switch gears really quickly. Uh, we've also been thinking about the plasma environment. If we have these hot regions within lunar pits adjacent to somewhat colder regions, could the ions flowing in from the solar wind sort of instantly boil off of hot surfaces and hot back into the colder regions? And are the cold regions really cold enough to, to keep them around for a while? So I'm applying a, a code that I developed at Goddard while I was a postdoc. Uh, it's designed for small body and lunar simulations. It's well tested by now um, and, and published. and uh, Basically, it allows us to, to simulate a, a lunar pit in high detail. Uh, and uh, as part of the Dream 2 uh, effort, we're, uh, it's undergoing major improvements in uh, uh, efficiency and various other factors. So here are the actual plasma physics results on the, on the left-hand panel. At two different times a day, I'm showing ion trajectories. Right? The little, little blue dots or arrows, which are sort of hard to see, they're ions, uh, protons coming in uh, from outer space. And what you notice is that the ions are so heavy and inertial that they basically follow along the illumination vector it, right, it, right into the lunar pit. They, the, this thing is so small, they don't, they don't even have time to, to know it's there, and they hit the surface. Um, 
so one really interesting thing is that we get electric fields along the wall of the crater uh, at different times of day. The electric field shape changes. But this is really going to be really interesting to plasma physicists because uh, it turns out these are actually lunar mini-wakes within lunar pits. We know that this, well, we think this sort of thing happens at topography at the poles where the solar wind is blocked. Uh, the flow of solar wind is obstructed by topography, and so we get uh, electron ion separations. Uh, which create uh, many wake electric fields, but the same thing ha can happen at a zero, uh, zero latitude uh, lunar pit um, just by virtue of the solar wind uh, flow angle changing. So I think uh, lunar pits really have something for everybody. So, uh, right, so uh, this is sort of my idea. I've been thinking about this question. Could the ions actually hit the hot surfaces in the lunar pits and hop into the colder regions? Uh, at mid-latitudes, the cold regions may be too hot because this, the subsurface temperature is pretty constant and it's going to be, uh, I think, probably too warm, warmer than maybe 100 to 120 Kelvin to keep uh, protons around. But maybe at higher latitudes, uh, it, these regions could become cold enough to become a, a volatile uh, storage uh, area, essentially. Um, but unfortunately, if you look at uh, Wagner and Robinson's recent Icarus paper from a couple months ago, these are really hard. Uh, the polar regions are, are where it's really hard to find the pits. Um, so I also direct your attention to uh, Bill Farrell's talk tomorrow, and he's been thinking about uh, surface defects, whether the surface is pristine or not. Uh, this could affect um, the retention rate for volatiles, uh, such as protons, uh, thus allowing hotter regions to retain more, uh, more hydrogen. Okay, and so, yeah, in lunar pits, I think there's something for everyone. We have plasma lakes, we have geologic uh, stratigraphy, uh, radiation processes, thermal processes, maybe traces of volatiles. Um, right now, uh, on my end, I'm uh, aiming to significantly, significantly improve the physical fidelity and resolution of the code. Uh, I'm already parallelized uh, part of the code, and uh, we want to implement the radiative transfer between different parts of the surface. Uh, we could also do all sorts of other things, including surface roughness, temperature-dependent bulk, parameters, uh, a lot of things we can do with the code. So uh, I think this code and the plasma code will uh, help us to identify future targets for exploration. And uh, there could be apl applicability to other bodies. I've already used the uh, plasma code for asteroids. Perhaps the uh, thermal code could be used there as well. Thanks. Uh, very interesting. Uh, in terms of habitability of these pits, I mean, I guess it would be easy to put some kind of a cover on top for the thermal protection and the plasma protection. Uh, but, you know, like cosmic rays would be a, a different beast right. being very deeply penetrating. Mm -hmm. So it would be interesting to kind of consider the effects of all those things and, you know, how you would build a, a very nice, big, habitable space out of this. Right. Thanks. Yeah, we, we could certainly uh, even potentially uh, include radiation uh, in this kind of a model. <clears throat> All right, we have, we have another question back there by the window. Could you bring the mic there? Subsurface pits are one possible habitable environment suggested for Mars. Basically, you haul out an area of ground and then cover over it. Could you extend this simulation to Mars? Uh, you, you certainly could. Um, you would, in that case, you would ha uh, have some heat probably carried away by the atmosphere, so that would need to be taken into account. But it could be uh, either combined with a fluid code or just some uh, bulk representation of the, uh, the heat flux due to uh, atmospheric uh, convection. I saw Rick Elphick jumping in the back. <laughs> um, so, Mike, this is really cool, really. I mean, maybe a little Thanks. too cool. Your initial <laughs> conditions should maybe be closer to the, just the equilibrium geotherm profile that we know from Apollo, at least the upper part of it we know from Apollo. And so starting off with those temperatures in the subsurface and then, you know, iterating on that with the insulation, seems like it'd get to the, the equilibrium a lot faster. Yeah, it's certainly uh, right. Hopefully it wouldn't take the thousands of lunations required uh, starting from zero. <clears throat> Thanks. Okay, well, uh, we'll stop there. I see there's still a couple of questions, but we'll, we'll meet up after the talk. Um.